good. So what's left? So we talked about um, the four obvious reasons for understanding that Genesis is historical narrative. So then the next question is, but there's always a but, and that is that some words have a range of meanings even within historical narrative. The dog barked, startled, I fell over and barked my shins. So we've used the same word in different ways, haven't we? The dog barked, startled, I fell over and I barked my shins. So scraped the front of the skin off my legs. So the word in the historical narrative that we're going to be focusing on today is yom, Y-O-M. And that's a Hebrew word for day. And the question is, does this Hebrew word for day, does it have a huge variety of meanings such that you can make the text mean what it says providing you're still understanding it as a historical narrative because this word day has got a variety of meanings. And it's true. The word yom, yom diddly dom, y-o-m, yom actually does have a range of meanings from being 12 hours, 24 hours to a, a longer period of time. So that's what we're going to look at now. I mentioned Granville Sharp. Granville Sharp was a... Um, they, they're responsible for a rule called the Granville Sharp Rule. came out in... Sem well, Granville Sharp... Granville's part came out in 1798, and it's just a way of looking at Greek language in the New Testament. And it says that if there's a, an article plus a substantive plus chi plus another substantive, it only refers to one referent, which I'm sure you all understood like I did the first time I read it. I didn't understand it at all. But basically it means that if you come across in the Greek New Testament a situation where it says, our God and Saviour Jesus... The Granville Sharp rule says that within certain confines, you know whether it's talking about our God, pause, and Jesus, our Saviour, or whether it's talking about our God and Saviour, who is Jesus. You understand the difference there? So the Granville Sharp rule was a really neat thing to discover about the Greek language. It's true each and every time, providing that the substantives the God and the Jesus, as in this example, are singular, they're not plural. Um, they're personal names or common names. So there's some Greek explanation for you. So what's this got to do with Yom? Not much, because Yom's Hebrew. But it's the same principle, in that we can study Hebrew language and see patterns. And this is what we're going to work with, with this word Yom. So, given that Yom can mean a few different things, how do we know that it means a day? Well, I'm going to go through some um, explanations about how do you know when yom means a day and how do you know when it might mean something else. So when yom is singular, like banana versus bananas, when you've only got one yom and it's simple, it's not in a grammatical construct. Um, a grammatical construct like might be husband and wife with all hyphens between them. That would be a grammatical construct. So whenever you come across yom in the Old Testament and it's mentioned about 2,300 times in the Old Testament, so we've got a big database to work with. Whenever yom is singular and simple, it always means day. That's pretty neat. And so 13 times in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 3, the word yom is singular and simple. So that's simple. It means day. What's well, this another clue that yom might mean day? Well, every time you have evening and morning and yom, which is something that happens 38 times, um, uh, sorry, it happens 19 times in the Old Testament plus six times in the... Um, actually, no, I'm getting my numbers mixed up. I might just forget about the numbers for now. Every time you come across that, then it always means a single 24-hour type normal day. Every time you come across evening and morning without yom, it always means a day. Every time you come across yom with a number in it, like second yom, three yoms, four yoms, whatever, uh, it always means a day. And every time you come across yom in an uninterrupted sequence of numbers, like you might find in the book of Numbers, chapter 7 and 29, it always means a day. So and this is what we find in Genesis. So in Genesis 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 3, yom is singular and simple. It's couched in evening and morning, and it's still got the word yom there. It's got a number with it, and there's a sequence of numbers. So you think it'd be pretty straightforward that, therefore, when you read Yom, day, in Genesis 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 3, it must mean a normal sort of a day. And that's how you can know whether it's just some professor saying it or whether there's some evidence behind it. So I've just given you some evidence about how you can you tell. But there's always another but. 
And what I'd like to do now is all about the but what abouts. So when you say these rules to someone, they'll say, but what about this? But what about that? You said this, that, you know, whenever yom's with a number, it means a day, but what about this verse? So we're going to go through a whole bunch of but what abouts. Does that sound like good fun? Yeah, because when you read Christians on the net or in books talking about Genesis 1 verse 1 to 2 verse 3 and whether it's straightforward historical narrative or whether it's just telling you a story and you can keep what bits you like and play with the text, um, they'll make these statements and they'll sometimes actually throw up some of these but what abouts. So I thought, well, let's go through them all. I've gone through all the ones that I could think of that are popular um, that you'll find easily on the net. So the first one is that yom with a number doesn't always mean a day. They say there's one exception. Well, this exception is Zechariah chapter 14, verse 7. And Gwenda's going to be kind enough to read. So this is one of the texts in the Old Testament, and it's talking about something strange happening in the future. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day there will be neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord, with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea in summer and in winter. Thank you very much, Gwenda. So if you understood that, you're doing really well. It's, it's talking about the future that is still yet to come, even though this is a part written in the Bible over 2,000 years ago before Jesus' time. Um, so that word unique day is actually yom with a number. So they say, look, there is one exception to the rule. Well, one exception is still an exception, and I grant that. But it's an interesting text, isn't it? Our Bibles actually don't call it day one. They call it a unique day. And that's because of the context. Now, what does the context tell you? The context tells you that it is a very strange day indeed, isn't it? There's neither evening nor morning. The context tells you that there's poetry there, doesn't it? There'll be living water. It says, when the evening comes, there will be light. I thought when evening comes, there will be dark. And so you can already tell that this is a very cryptic passage. This is not historical narrative. So yes, it's an exception, but it's screaming out to you that it's an exception. So that's the first but what about. The second but what about is much more popular, and it's to do with Genesis 2, verse 14. Genesis 2, verse 4. And Gwenda's going to read this. And this is the other supposed exception to Yom, um, 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 being a single, uh, Yom with a number being a, a, a simple day. Thank you, Gwenda. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Good. So you didn't pick up anything there because this English version says when. If you read a King James version, it says instead of when, it says on the day that God made the heavens and the earth. And people say, aha on the day that God made the heavens and earth, but there was just six days. So therefore, the six days can't really be six days because it later on said that on the day that God made all that, and that's talking about one day, that day. But the reason is, is that because in Genesis 2 verse 4, yom is not single or simple. Yom is in a grammatical compound construction. And so it's got a preposition stuck onto it, and it's stuck onto a couple of other words. It's beyond. And that's why in your Bibles it's translated as when. It means at that time. So once again, if you're a Hebrew reader, you'd pick it up. If you read in your Bibles in Genesis 2 verse 17, you'll talk, you read about how God's saying to Adam and Eve that on the day you eat, when, you, when you eat that fruit, you will die. Once again, the word is when. And then the same with uh, Genesis 3 verse 5 and then in the book of Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 7 uh, verses 10 and 84. So these are... Uh, things where yom is not simple and singular. So it's not an exception. So two exceptions that aren't exceptions. So the third one then is, um, is to do with, uh, we talked about yom with a number in, Genesis, in uh, Zechariah. We've talked about yom with a number being um, uh, um, 
Genesis 2. The next one is Hosea. And so this talks about how there is Yom with a number and the guy is saying that this obviously isn't meant to be a single day. So Hosea 6 verse 2 is very similar to a whole bunch of other verses that we'll have a quick look at. So we're going to look at Proverbs 6 verse 16, Proverbs 30 verse 15, Proverbs 30 verse 18, um, maybe Job verse 5, chapter 5 verse 19, Amos 1 verse 3 verse 6 verse 9. What do all these have in common? They have a very simple thing in common. They all have an idiom in them. What is an idiom? Does anyone want to say one? It's raining cats and dogs. It's an idiom, isn't it? So the idiom in, in this Hebrew is that they say... Um, like he, Hosea 6 verse 2, after two days he will restore us, after, three, after two days he will revive us, after three days he will restore us. So there's that idiom, two, and then the next line's got one more. So in Proverbs 6 verse 16 it says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that he detests. Um, and then in, in, in Proverbs um, 30 verse 15 it says, there are um, three things, um, um, i trying to remember now, there are three things uh, that the... What is it up there? We got it up there? No, we don't. So Gwenda's going to read from uh, the Bible some of these passages. Okay, Proverbs 30, verse 15. There are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. Verse 18. There are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. So in each of these cases, the verse is using an idiom. But the things are real. So when it says there are three things and then there are four, it gives real examples. Three things that never are satisfied, four that never say enough. What are they? The grave, never satisfied. The barren womb, never satisfied. The land that's always in drought, never satisfied. And fire. So it's personifying them, but they're still things. They're still real things, aren't they? They haven't changed their meaning. A Hebrew reader will understand that what the idiom is, is that... Yes, there are six things the Lord hates and seven that he detests, but that's not all of them. The numbers are the exception, not the words. So the words keep their real meaning. Fire, grave, barren womb. These meanings don't change. The, he, what's changed is simply that the number is figurative. So equally, it's, once again, it's not an exception to the rule that yom plus a number always means a yom being this, a day because... That noun doesn't change. You understand what I'm saying there? Yeah, the other one is, is about um, three things that are too amazing, four that I don't understand. That's fun, that one. He doesn't understand the eagle going through, th flying through the sky. He doesn't understand the movement of a snake under a rock, on a rock. He doesn't understand the way a ship moves through the sea. And he doesn't understand the way a man reacts to a woman. And uh, so even back then... People, men would act very strange. So once again, these things were very real, but the reader realised that the number was just what was figurative in that case. But the, the original words keeps its meaning. So then there's some big verses that I come across from time to time when I talk to people. And this is Psalms. So in the Psalms, Psalm 90 verse 4, there's this verse that says, For in the sight of the Lord, a thousand years is like a day gone by, like a watch in the night. And people say, ah, John, here's a case where it seems to be saying that a day is not necessarily a day. So Gwenda's going to read out this passage. So it's Psalms. So you're thinking, well, what is Psalms? Psalms is a book of songs. So what does it say? A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. So does that verse mean that every time you come across the word day, you've got no idea of the length of time? Well, of course not. It's got some clues. So remember we talked about idioms like uh, um, her teeth are white as snow. 
So it's a, um, uh, an idiom, isn't it? A metaphor, if you like. It's a simile, in fact. Sorry, it's not a metaphor. It's a simile. It's got the word like there. And so when you read that Old Testament passage, it says that a thousand years is like a day to God. And what's the context? It's saying that in God's view, um, um, he is eternal because it talks about him being around from before the creation of the world, that he is from everlasting to everlasting. It compares that to our lot where we are like the grass that shoots up in the morning but withers in the afternoon. It's also got that beyom word. It's got that yom that's not simple. It's in a compound construct. So it's also another warning to us that this is not just the normal word yom. And so once again, this is all telling us that this is not a way for you to suddenly think that I don't understand what yom means when I read the Old Testament. So notice it says that the day in the Lord's eye is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day in the Lord's eye and I like a watch in the night. What's a watch in the night? It's not something you wore. It was a period of about three or four hours at night time. So does that mean when you read about something in the Old Testament that had a watch in the night that you had no idea how long that was? Well, of course not. That's nonsense. So in Judges chapter 7, you realise you read about a battle starting in the watch in the night. Well, when did it happen? Did it happen during a three or four hour period or did it happen over a thousand year period? Well, you know that it happened over a three or four hour period because it's, it's grammatical, um, historical uh, narrative and also it's uh, um, a simile. So does that make sense? That just because you, you're reading from God's perspective doesn't mean you've suddenly got no idea what these words mean every time you come across them. A similar one is in 2 Peter 3 verse 8 and Gwenda's going to read that as well. Yeah. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of the water and by water. By these waters also the word, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So once again, it's using that simile. It's telling you that, the day is not a thousand years, or a thousand years is a day. It's got the word like there. It's clearly a simile. It's not an excuse for you to say, I don't understand what a day means when I read the rest of the New Testament. So when we read about Acts chapter 1, verse 3, where Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to people for 40 days, well, was that 40,000 years or 40 days? Well, of course it was 40 days. You understand that 2 Peter is talking about a simile. And it's a beautiful passage. It's talking about how patient God is with us all. He's really trying to connect with us. So there's some other ones that people try to use as exceptions to the rules I gave you before. Um, it's about quarter to nine. We've got two more topics to come. So we might leave the rest of the but what abouts to another night or another time. Of course, the next section is, uh, the last section tonight is about Adam and Eve and where do all the races come from, if we really did just come from Adam and Eve. And we've got a short section on the history of all this. So um, now feel free to stand up there yeah, and have a little break. Thank you. Think of some questions if you like. Yeah. Okay, we'll start off now. We're going to finish with uh, language and we're going to look at Adam and Eve and biology. We're going to look at human races. So uh, take a seat. Um, Connor's got a roving mic, so we've got time for just one question. David, thanks, Connor. And I forgot to say, by the way, because I, I couldn't see him and uh, there's so many people to thank, but Mikey is the guy who's really responsible for coordinating so many other technical crews. So thank you very much, Mikey. And David, what's your question? Um, I don't know how to frame it. I'm a Christian, but um, just with um, like the law of relativity and time, potentially ideas around time stretching, um, Einstein's laws of relativity, Hawking talks about um, time. Benny, how how does that? 
do, is it possible with God being the almighty creator of the universe that um, time is referred to in the Bible in a context that we can just understand hmm. and it might even just be, be beyond us? Okay, great. Therefore, great question. do I even question it? Yeah, I think I understand where you're coming from, David. Good question. So David's asking, um, you know, when the Bible um, talks about these days, was that there just to instruct us? So, um, or, or, um, or was it there because it was just the best he could do? Uh, we finished off that last talk very quickly. One of the arguments against understanding Yom as a day is that the Hebrews didn't have any other words for time. And uh, what I was going to mention is that the Hebrews actually had 11 other words for periods of time that could be used much more appropriately if it was long periods of time. And so Dor and Olek are two of those. And Hebrew language actually had a way of talking about the past in a variety of ways. So an event that was finished that happened a long time ago, event that started a long time ago but's not yet finished, which is what evolution's all about. So if they wanted to, they could have used that vocabulary, that, those tenses, if you like, those aspects, to convey that message. But the Bible doesn't use those words or those tenses or aspects that were available to it. It even had a way of talking about ambiguous time. So talking about something that happened but not telling you about how long it took or when it happened. But once again, Genesis didn't use that. So Genesis is, is God speaking to us very clearly. And so that's how we know that... Um, they had such another choice of words. We don't believe that God would have spoken to us in a deceiving way, but in a truthful way. So thanks for that. Yeah, and that's 1 Thessalonians um, uh, talks about how, how we worship a God of life and truth. Christians don't believe that God's tried to deceive us or trick us. So good question. Okay. Listen.